As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have a distinguished returning guest tonight, David Morgan, renowned guru on the precious metals markets, consultant to uh, funds and investors uh, and all those who want to be in the know about the physical f silver and gold and other precious metals markets is back here with us again on Reluctant Preppers. David, thank you for joining us again. It's great to be back. Thank you. The last time we had you on in early September, the silver and gold had just done a price breakout. They had been running up against resistance, uh, silver in, in particular, for some time and had finally punched through 1850, then 1950, then 20, and it really looked like uh, some some uh, a resistance that had been in place for some time had finally been penetrated, and there were several commenters on uh, various channels and outlets that were talking about uh, that this was a very significant move. There's been a, a lot of consolidation since then, and just this week, a significant uh, retreat back to some support levels. But if you could give us your view of uh, silver's uh, price action and what you see as behind it and what you think the most likely next move uh, is going to be. Okay. Well, first of all... Uh the movement that we saw, first of all, I want to make a very general statement about a bull market. And the function of a bull market, the bull, the metaphor, is to shake off as many people as it possibly can during the run to the top of the market, which means that there will be scary corrections along the way. And we just witnessed one this week. So as favorable as I am in the precious metals, these scary corrections are going to take place and they are going to take place again. Why did it happen? Well, it's very simple and very almost trite to say it, but the real facts are there were a lot, there's a lot more selling pressure than buying pressure. And of course that begs the second question of why or how. And here's where we have to speculate a bit, but primarily that couple things. One is that the Chinese were really not in the market like they have been in the past. There have been some what I consider to be orchestrated sell-offs in the paper paradigm, the paper markets, the futures markets, that were significant and drove gold and silver down rather significant percentage-wise, but they were intraday moves. For example, I think it was 70 tons of gold, uh, not that long ago, a month or two, I forget exactly. And I think it drove the price down 20 or $25, but at the end of the day, off only 5 So I made commentary on that to the website members and the public domain, stating that the metals are trading differently. And that's a fact. However, this week, uh, the 1st of October, was um, a national day for China, and the rest of the week was very light if any trading. So the Chinese, I believe, and I've proven this in, uh, for my website members in pretty good detail, have pretty much matched the shorts of the commercials on the CME. But they're gone. So now what took place is what has been taking place for years and years and years, which is basically the commercial interest versus the trading funds and no outside pressure from uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So the sell-off started, and it started going you know, straight down. Waterfall decline, uh, tripped a lot of sell stops, and there were a lot of, uh, of movement to the downside. So that's the way I see it. I think primarily it was a shift in the market because of some people that normally participate in the market were not there. And also, you know, to be uh, as objective as I possibly can, and going back to what I started with, all markets move up and down, including precious metals. Fundamentals long term couldn't be better. But that doesn't mean after a six month move, we were um, due for some type of correction, manipulated or not. And lastly, as you mentioned, and again, we were in a high-level consolidation for a while. And I was warning my members that I felt it was more likely to come down than go up. 
I was also uh, playing it both ways, which when you do technical work, most of us do. And I did state that it was possible that we could see a very significant move to the upside that would probably be a one-day event only. And that was possible, but I wasn't that likely. And I explained that to the members, but said, you know, more significantly, I think we're coming down. So I encouraged a lot of them to take par uh, profits, partial profits, or hedge with puts on their mining or resource stock uh, picks. And, of course, you do the same thing with your metals positions. And, you know, I can't trade for people. All I could do is outline what I'm doing. And it depends on their temperament, what the size of their positions are. Uh, and those sort of things. But I did pretty much uh, let everyone know that is a member that, uh, you know, the downside is going to happen. Did I expect the waterfall to climb this sharp? No, not really. But we're right now at a level that's around the 200-day moving average. Will it hold or not? I think there's at least a 50-50 chance that it will. And uh, we just have to wait and see. I also expect that I'll probably turn around pretty quickly, meaning there'll be like a V bottom. But just because we get a quick turnaround doesn't mean it's going to go back to $21 within you know a couple of weeks. I'm afraid that there'll be some overhead resistance in the you know, $18, $19 level that we'll have to work through. So probably by the end of the year, we may be back in the 20s. The one cautionary note is that the metals – during this bear phase that took significant time, you know, four or five years, that the lowest price print year after year after year was the last trading day of the year. So I don't want to get that out of our consciousness. In fact, uh, last year, we got the lowest print. I think it was the last trading day in November or first or so trading day of December. But it was right near the end of the year. Historically, the seasonality is actually strong for the metals in the fourth quarter, particularly the last month or two. But that has not been the case the last five years. So I think we all have to keep that in mind as well. So, you know, we may have seen, you know, the best of the metals from, you know, January through, uh, you know, September kind of thing. And we might have to consolidate for four months at the end of the year and wait for next year to start seeing a move up, you know, with some – you know, real zest. I don't know yet. Don't have enough data, but certainly that's kind of my overall look right now. Speaking of the Chinese, you mentioned them uh, being basically missing from their uh, their more recent uh, participation as buyers. Uh, you know, s providing support and and sort of thwarting some of those uh, attacks on precious metals prices in the first half. Uh, on September 30th, we had the Chinese yuan added for the first time ever to the SDR basket of currencies. Uh, several analysts had called for that to be a uh, tipping point for the U.S. dollar's uh, domination as the world reserve currency. And there's been you know, some debate about whether and if you could clarify for us at this point in time, is the Chinese yuan backed at all by gold or is do you believe that that's realistic that that will change to be that way in the future? And if so, what would be the likely impact of its influence uh, on not only the SDR, but on the uh, U.S. dollar holdings globally? Well, the SDR is just another fiat currency, but it's sort of a, a world or global currency. Now that the yuan is part of it, I think it's at about around an 8% level. So now you basically have a, a, a world currency issued by the IMF which has no citizenry to back up or be responsible for the debt. So they could just print to infinity and no one's responsible for it other than, uh, you know, the computers. I mean, so will it, you know, work or not work? I don't know. The idea that, you know, it'd be bad for the U.S. dollar, well, the dollar still holds up, you know, 40-something percent. But <clears throat> longer term, yeah. I mean, this is a way for a lot of nation states to exit the dollar and hold SDRs instead, plus they can issue bonds in their currency like the renminbi or the yuan and uh, and use their surplus dollars to do that. So in other words, they can exchange currencies through this vehicle of the uh, IMF's SDR. So I think long term is significant. I think the more important question is what you asked, which means that I think – strongly studying the Chinese and the currency markets. The Chinese are very much 
wanting to go along with the currency game as long as they possibly can, which means will gold come in or a gold back you want or some part of the SDR have a gold component? And the answer is yes, if and only if, or I should say when, because for me it's not an if, the next crisis happens that's so huge that the only way to regain confidence is to put gold into the equation. But I don't see it happening before that. So first we've got to wait and see what happens over the next you know, two, three, four months, six months. We need some time to watch, wait, and evaluate what the SDR is really going to do, how significant is it going to be, is it as powerful as it has been purported to be by some analyst, or as V, the, the rogue economist uh, who was interviewed recently on a show that I listened to, stated that really the IMF has got a big fat name, but really not much sway, and that the AIIB, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, is far more significant than uh, the IMF. And I tend to agree with him uh, after thinking about it. However, I think the Chinese are very willing to go along, again, in the currency game, however it works. So they're willing to be flexible about it. They are not, at this time, willing to put up any gold until it's absolutely necessary. But at the end of the day, when everything else is falling apart, the conference is, lo is lost, on a global scale or a significant enough scale, that gold has to be used to quell the markets, to rebuild stability, to regain confidence in the system. Uh, it will happen. And at that point, maybe everyone at the table has got to you know, put their gold out in front of them and say, this is it. And when that day happens, and using that metaphor, that poker game analogy, I think the Chinese are going to show a lot more physical gold than uh, than probably any other nation state. Well, you're if asking you're, the question I wanted to, you know, to ask yep. you right next, which is we've had a lot of controversy about the amount of actual gold that different countries hold. The the most uh, common uh, consensus I've heard is that the gold holdings in China, for example, are typically understated. Uh, we've heard the opposite uh, from most commentators about the United States, uh, theory and, and uh, Europeans such as uh, England and others. Um, but uh, there, then we've had some people, uh, Bix Weir is one notable we've had on, who, who claims that gold is much more uh, plentiful than is often thought and that it's being held back uh, for after the collapse of the fiat system and, and to usher in a new era, where can people turn when they, they hear just these hot and cold stories about there's hardly any gold, there's tons of gold, it's over here, it's over there? Uh, why is it so mysterious? And where do you think the most credible sources of truth are about it? Since this is like the main line of, of your, a lot of your research is, is that what is the truth about investable metals? Yeah, great question. I forget the name of the book, but I read it. Uh, that has this idea that there's far more gold uh, than stated uh, in the you know in the public and private domain. Uh, so one, I don't know. I mean, let's just be as honest as I can. Two, after reading that book and doing some interviews, no one convinced me that that huge amount of gold that's uh, talked about and this relationship with the uh, I think it's called the white. Dragon Society is real, but I wouldn't rule it out. What I do know is that the ratio of gold to silver coming out of the ground right now is about 10 to 1. And I also know that in the 13th century, it was about 12 to 1. So using that as a fact and then extrapolating with a very simple math problem, if the above ground historical amount of silver that's ever been dug out since you know we started recording things in history which has been quite some time is 60 billion ounces of silver then one tenth that amount is six billion ounces of gold so the official numbers make the most sense to me uh this other idea that there's a lot more gold i just don't buy it but I don't know for a fact. But, you know, if you're going to put me on a witness stand as an expert witness and what I've studied, looked at, et cetera, that's how I'd answer the question. 
turning that back to which which nations then you you mentioned specifically regarding um economic power in the world balance of power uh what what are what do you uh, are convinced of based on your research is where where the major gold holdings are between different nation states right so china has far more than they say the reason that china reports what they do is people ask the wrong question uh, i just did an update for our uh for our website members. And in this uh, one that I just completed, I showed the uh, warehouse, the warehouses or the banks really on the CME. So the Commodity Mercantile Exchange has a certain number of what I'll call warehouses. Again, they're mostly banks. There's one Scotia Mercata, there's Brinks, there's Coins and Things, there's JP Morgan, there's a few more. So if someone was to ask the United States and say, how much silver is held by J.P. Morgan at the CME, as registered at the CME, the answer would be 76 million ounces. Now, if you thought you had asked how much silver is held by... JP Morgan, that wouldn't account for what they have, let's say, in uh, Singapore or Hong Kong or something like that. So the question that has been asked is how much is held officially at basically this depository in China? And the Chinese have answered that with the exact answer to the question, which is a lower amount than if you asked the correct question, which is how much official and unofficial gold is held under state name and all other entities that are at least touched by the state or you know i have to frame the question perhaps a little yeah. better but if you say what's your total gold holdings within the country both public and private what would that number be regardless of where it's stored that's the number you want and that number is far higher than the how much is stored in official records at this particular location, which is the answer they keep giving us. But that's the question we keep asking. How about for other nations? Uh, what, so you, you say that China, the answer comes in uh, much lower than reality because the wrong question is being asked. But what about the balance of holdings, in your opinion, between various countries? Well, the U.S. is a real tough one. I mean, I have, you know, friends that are in the industry and pretty high up the scale. And, you know, I don't like to argue with people, but I'll stand my ground. You know, I mean, there's an official report given every year about what's held by the U.S. And it's a, you know, it's a line item. It says gold and it gives the amount. It's roughly 265 million ounces of gold. But I don't believe it. I believe that, um, that, First of all, the way they account for it, and if you read the fine print, what it means, because there's this deep storage and all this other nonsense, it doesn't mean anything except in legal terms. So the best I can understand from what we do know is the amount of gold held that's unencumbered by the U.S. in the Treasury is probably a very small percentage of what was held the last time was accounted for at the 265 million ounce level. I'd like to add on to that, that there's been a lot of people that have tried to get that audited. And also a very important point that most people seem to miss is that the Federal Reserve owns no gold. In fact, I put that video up about every other year on my Twitter feed. Because the Federal Reserve has gold certificates, but they gave the gold back to the Treasury. So the Fed holds pieces of paper officially, and purportedly, the Treasury owns the gold, which is really how it's supposed to be. I mean, that gold is supposed to be the gold that the people own. It's supposed to be held you know, or owned by the citizenry of the United States of America. But... Regardless, I'm probably giving you too long an answer, Dunnigan, but it's it's very disturbing to me that there probably isn't much real gold uh, that's unencumbered in the U.S. And secondly, and this is a fantasy of mine, and I think I've been proven wrong, that I always had in the back of my mind for you know years, I mean, you know, more than a decade, 
couple decades that once the cat was out of the bag, the metaphor meaning that once everybody knew officially that the U.S. had no gold, that like the next day the dollar would collapse. Well, that's probably watching too many of these uh, docudramas on the financial system because that's sort of how I thought it could happen. But uh, I think most of us in the gold realm and that are the alternative media know full well that there isn't much official gold that's really unencumbered. And yet that seems to have really no significance to, uh, you know, what happens in the, you know, in the trading realm. Earlier, you mentioned not only the price, you know, dealing with physical gold uh, trading, uh, also options like puts to protect, to hedge against drops in price. You also mentioned uh, gold miners. Uh, we've been hearing more and more about uh, people interested in investing in gold mining stocks as this year has progressed and gold and silver have, you know, shown some strength this year. What is the expected price action? How do gold mining stocks typically behave relative to the price of physical gold and silver during either a bull or bear market? Well, it's a way to gain leverage. And, you know, to be honest, I've made more money on paper gold than I've made in physical gold, <clears throat> not counting, you know, leverage positions. And the reason for that is there is a ratio roughly three to one. So if gold goes up 30 percent, a miner will go up 100 percent. But it works both directions. So you got to be very careful. And this is what I mean by leverage. I mean, just because of the ratio between how a miner's profits are calculated versus just owning a piece of metal. So in a bull market, you're going to do much, much better with owning miners than you will owning bullion. But that doesn't hold the whole time. And that's kind of the tricky part. When you get near the top of the market, you really want to divest yourself of the miners and hold bullion, and bullion will actually outperform. So, you know, I want to be clear because, I, in fact, I just came back from a trip to Canada, and my friend uh, Nick Barishev and I did an interview in his uh, in his uh, facility, and you know, we went over some of this stuff before the interview. And so, there are times when gold actually does better than the miners. But there are times when it, it, it's not true that the miners do better. So you kind of have to, you know, study it. I mean, it's nothing that mysterious. If you look at uh, what happened in the 1980s, for example, and you can go back this up to your own research and verify what I'm saying. Gold peaked in January, but the miners didn't peak until June, July, and August. So you actually could sell your physical gold in January at the top or near the top. Let's say I sold some mine at 700. I didn't get out all of it out of the top. Um, and then the miners kept going up for another six months or so. Now, will that happen the next time? We don't know, but it is a fact that it did it the last time. So there is this kind of, uh, it's two different trading styles too. I mean, you have one that's a commodity, which of course it's really money, but it's called a commodity. And those are commodity mindsets, commodity traders, highly leveraged, lots of, uh, you know, trading programs. Of course that exists in stocks now as well. And then you have stock investors, which is different than commodity traders. So there is a kind of a back and forth between the two. Any tips for people of preparedness who have accumulated or want to accumulate some physical silver as far as what type of silver might be the most suitable for bartering if hard times come? Well, the best is small units. I mean, one is, uh, you know, constitutional silver, what's known in the trade as junk bags. You can buy a quarter bag or a half bag or a full bag, which is a thousand face value. That would be one. The other one is a one ounce round, either a private mint, which is one ounce of silver, or a government mint, which is a coin, one ounce of silver. That may prove to be um, more than you want in certain barter situations. I mean, maybe a tenth ounce of silver is more suitable, which is roughly what a dime is worth. Uh, but no one knows. But I wouldn't want, you know, I would advise anyone listening that if you're going to buy silver and you have enough to buy, let's say, 100 ounces, that rather than save the premium by buying one 100-ounce bar and getting like a 4% markup instead of like, say, a 6 7 or 8% markup for coin, you're still far better off paying a higher premium to get, you know, 100 one-ounce coins uh, than a one, one bar because you have a hundred, you know, decisions that you can make or a hundred trades you can perform uh, 
or whatever. I mean, you might make one tray with 10 ounces, but you can't break that 100 ounce bar into 10 ounces. So you don't really want to get into the bar market until you have had accumulated a fair amount of stacking in the coin realm. You want small units. And uh, not almost last is uh, any tips of philosophy for a diehard silver stacker. I mean, we have to take your advice earlier that you said a bull market is going to try its best to shake you off its back. Anything else that sort of follows onto that, the, what you would say a philosophical advice to a silver stacker? Yeah, I maybe. I mean, if I can help, I think most of the silver stackers are really savvy. I mean, most of them have just got a very good uh, self-taught, in most cases, educational background on, you know, why the fiat systems always fail. They've got pretty much a methodical way of stacking, you know, week after week or day after day, week after week, month after month or quarter after quarter. They've got their own paradigm of how they've set up their stacking ideology. And uh, I think a lot of them don't let these uh, quick, sharp uh, corrections, sell-offs, manipulations, whatever you want to call it, scare them out. And they just plot along. The only thing I would add is that you don't want to make it a religion. You don't need to make it too much of your overall uh, net worth. I mean, the main mistake I see with some of the calls I get for consultations is people that, you know, hear the silver story from myself or, but usually it's somebody else, but, you know, somebody, and they just get the idea that you can't lose buying silver. Um, you're going to, silver's going to be extinct any day. Uh, none of it's recycled. Uh, well, and all of these are just not true. And so they bet the farm on silver after doing kind of a cursory look at the market uh, and not understanding the real dynamics of the precious metals and that it's more of a hedge position against the fiat system or governments in general than it is a way to solve all your problems financially. So, you know, stack, stack away. I think it's a great approach, but have the right balance. You know, 10 percent is probably enough for most people. I kind of stress 20%, but I think going above that, you need to be pretty much a professional in the industry. Do I have more than 20%? You bet I do. But, you know, it's my life. It's the way I make a living. It's something I've studied for more than 40 years, and I'm comfortable with that. You know, I mean, just looking at this last week's market where we went from, you know, 1950 down to, you know, we had a print near 17, you know, a $2, $2.5 move. Especially if you're leveraged, and I'm leveraged from the aspect of having, uh, you know, mining shares. You know that is a very discouraging, to put it in polite terms. But I've been through it so many times. Of course, I called the fact that we should lighten up. And do I take my own advice? You bet I do. So you know, I certainly lightened up. Uh, but this is something that uh, can be very disheartening to a new investor because the beta or the movement, the volatility of the mining shares and gold and silver in general is higher than a lot of other investment classes. Before we let you go, are you willing to tell us something about your new Silver Prepper website? Yeah, well, I was asked by uh, a uh, food storage uh, facility, one of the best, I think, Numana. It is one that I use, I bought from, and since I bought a fair amount, they asked if they could uh, if i would be interested in promoting their product and i said yes i would because it's you know non-gmo uh you can also get gluten-free buckets which is what i prefer to do i don't have a gluten problem my sister and my girlfriend do so after i checked it out and, and used it i said yeah i'll endorse it so they actually brought me the domain silverprepper.com and you can check it out, get a starter kit. I think like I teach on silver, you know, start small and, you know, deal with the dealer and see if you like it and how you're treated and all that. So you can get like a starter pack for, I think, 25 bucks or something. And I'm trying to make it a bit unique done again. So I'm working with one of the um, silver solutions people that I interviewed and did a lot of research on. And they have a book called The World's Most Precious Metal. And it's silver, and it doesn't have to do with the monetary aspect. It has to do with the health and healing aspects of it. I interviewed both of these doctors. I had them make all the medical claims, not me. And that book, The Most Precious Metal, 
is something that is going to be updated here soon. So I'm thinking of working with both parties and seeing if I can build a synergy where the silverprepper.com website for this um, non-GMO uh, food that's, uh, you know, f- f- survival food, I guess you call it, or whatever, emergency food, will also include, like, this book on um, on silver. Maybe we'll throw in, like, uh, you know, the silver solution or some of the silver gel or something like that. But I haven't worked out the details yet, but I'm trying to make it a bit unique because I like the fact of how they do their food. Oh, by the way, they are coming out with, like, an organic bucket, which is how I try to eat most of the time. Uh, and this is in work, and I don't know when it's going to be available. I don't want to say it's going to be by such and such a date because I might miss it. But it's a company that I really know, I trust, and I use their food. And it's not just about, you know, times like a hurricane was hitting Florida now. It can be used for camping. It can be used if you're like me. You're single again, and you don't feel like going to the store all the time. You can whip out their chilies really good. You can just, you know, boil some water, throw it in there, and you got a hot meal on a cold night, and it's pretty easy to prepare. Uh, is it more expensive than going down and getting a can of chili? Yes, it is. But also, the last 25 years, it's very convenient. And again, in an emergency, it's there for you. Well, David Morgan, founder of the morganreport.com, which is also your newsletter that people can sign up for. Thank you so much once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. We'd like to check in with you again before the end of the year to see what direction uh, precious metals are taking, whether we buck the trend of the last five years and end the year on a strong note, or if it's going to be uh, you know, fading to the finish of this year and, and waiting uh, to come out and break out of these, uh, this holding pattern in the new year. Well, thanks for having me. I hope it was beneficial to your listeners. Well, thank you, David. See you again.